Good morning, Tim Pullen coming to you again from the sanctuary and Lakeview Church of the Nazarene in Waynesville, North Carolina. Hope that you're having a good day today and I hope and pray that the Lord ministers to you during our time together. Let us go to Him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning in the name of your Son, Jesus, our Savior, the one who gave his life on the cross so that we could be cleansed and made suitable vessels for your presence, presence in our lives and presence in our world through us. Heavenly Father, today we come before you acknowledging that we are needy people. We need your forgiveness. We need your strength. We need your wisdom. We need your guidance. We need your help. We need your encouragement. We need your healing. We need your wisdom. We need your support. We need to know that you are with us and that you are for us. And we need to know that you have a plan for us that will give us indeed a, a hope and a future. Not just in this life, but in the life that, that follows. Today, Lord, I pray on behalf of your people that you would minister to every need represented in our congregation and those watching and listening wherever they may be. Where there's a need for physical healing or strength, Lord, provide that today. Where the, there's a need for emotional support or strength or comfort or peace, provide that as well. Lord, where there's a need for relational reconciliation, provide that as well and help us, Lord, to come together and to work together to overcome our differences, to remember that we are all children created in your image. And you love each and every one of us dearly enough to send your Son to die for us. Lord, I pray that you would provide for any other need that might be represented in our congregation today. You know each one, Lord, if it's financial or other. Lord, we know that you are the God of a thousand hills. And you own the cattle on those hills and the tailors under the hills. And you can provide for us. And you promised you would as uh, we have need, just as you provide for the sparrows and clothe the lilies. Now, Lord, be with us in our time together today. Speak to us from your word. Help us to understand who we are and where we are in relationship to you primarily, but also in relationship to the world in which we live, so that we may represent you to this world correctly and that the world may be represented to you through us, through our prayers of intercession. And Lord, use us as agents of reconciliation, this ministry which Paul said you have now given to us. Be with us today, help us today, and in all the days to come to be more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. This morning I'd like to uh, address with you the subject of facing the 800 pound gorilla in the room. That gorilla being me. Not just me, but the rhetorical me. <laughs> in Galatians 3, verse 23 and following we read, Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many as of you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. May the Lord add his blessing and our understanding to the reading of his word today. I've spent uh, most of the past nearly 30 years in ministry trying to avoid preaching what I call reactionary sermons. That's what I call a sermon that is preached primarily in response to whatever the hot-button topic of the day might be. <clears throat> That's why, although 
I have alluded to some of the recent events going on in our country, I have at least tried to avoid making a whole sermon simply be about any one of those topics. And I continue to try to avoid preaching simply in reaction to something that's in the news. But there comes a time when, especially if there's a spiritual principle at work regarding something happening in our area or in our nation or even in our world as a whole, that as a faithful messenger of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I must speak to the issues that affect us in the here and now and not simply address global truisms. And so today, I intend to share with you some thoughts based on Scripture that I feel address a matter uh, that is very much in the news, although it is not in any way something new in itself. It has simply been brought to the surface by recent events and has become the 800-pound gorilla in the, gr in the room that no one uh, can continue to ignore any longer. And that is the matter of racism. Just this past week, I spent two hours in a Zoom meeting online with pastors from across North Carolina and with our district superintendent and two of our national denominational leaders who are pastors who happen to be black. One of these men has been appointed by our general board to head up the Black Strategic Readiness Team of the Church of the Nazarene, and another is a member of that team who pastors in New York. During that meeting, I was reminded of something I've heard many times recently and am only beginning to understand, and that is how difficult it is to live in this country as a person of color, more specifically as a black person. I would like to look at the Bible to get a clearer understanding of Jesus' view on race, how he treated people of different races, and what having a truly Christ-like attitude toward people of different races and cultures looks like. I think it's a good starting point to say that Jesus was a person of color. He was not Anglo-Saxon, European by descent. He was born into the Jewish race. <clears throat> As such, his skin was most likely uh, of an olive shade, and his hair was likely very dark, and perhaps he had eyes that would have been brown. More significantly, Jesus lived in a time when people like him were under the oppression and domination of white Europeans, the Romans, who took control of them away from other white Europeans, the Greeks, who had taken control of them after the Persians, who took control of them after the Babylonians. If there ever was an oppressed people, it was the race of people into which Jesus chose to be born. And let us not forget that as a race, his chosen people had spent nearly 400 years in captivity in Egypt, 800 years or so before the Babylonians came along. It seems, however, that every race has to have someone to look down on. And even the Jews had such a race, the Samaritans, to treat this way. In fact, the Jews of Jesus' day tended to look upon all other races as being inferior since they were God's chosen race. This was a reality that the early church would have to address very early on in its existence after Christ ascended to heaven and left the gospel in their hands. But how did Jesus himself address the race issue? First of all, I think we can see from the scriptures that Jesus did not ignore racial barriers. In Matthew chapter 15, beginning at verse 22, we read, And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she's crying out after us. <clears throat> he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. In another story in John chapter 4, 
beginning at verse 7, we read, A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and this well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that Messiah is coming, He who is called Christ. When He comes, He will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am He. In another story in Luke chapter 7, beginning at verse 1, we read, after he had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion who had a servant who was sick and at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. <clears throat> when the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is the one who built our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore I did not presume to come to you. But say the word, and let my servant be healed. For I too am a man of authority, <clears throat> with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turning to the crowd that followed him, said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. In yet another story in Luke chapter 8, we read, beginning at verse 26, Then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he had not lived in a house but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to command them to depart to the abyss, into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him to let them enter these. 
So he gave them permission, and the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs. And the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told the city in the city and in the country. Then people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. Now in each of these cases we see that Jesus did not pretend to be blind to the race issue. But neither did he allow race or racial issues to prevent him from caring for and ministering to the individuals who stood before him in need. He healed the daughter of the Canaanite woman. He offered, offered the thirsty Samaritan woman, who was an outcast among her own people, water that would quench her thirst forever. He admired and acknowledged the faith of the centurion and healed his servant. And he liberated the demon-possessed Gerasene man, then enlisted him as his messenger to the man's own people regarding the power of God that was at work in Jesus. If you remember in John chapter 3, Jesus told Nicodemus that it was because God so loved the world, the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him might not perish, but have everlasting life. As we discussed last week, on two occasions He instructed His disciples to go and make disciples of all nations and to be His witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Jesus was of a certain race that He, in fact, helped to create through 90-year-old Sarah and 100-year-old Abraham. He was part of a specific race, and he was conscious of his ethnicity. He acknowledged that barriers existed between those of his own race and those of other races. But he did not allow those differences to prevent him from ministering his grace to those people who stood in front of him in need, asking for help. By acknowledging the barriers that existed, Jesus was not being a racist, but he was rather exposing racism that was already present. And his actions served to tear down the racial divides to, that, to the extent that any one man's actions can do so. I mentioned earlier that the fledgling church had to address the matter of racism pretty early on in its existence. Peter was told in a vision to eat foods that had been he had been taught from infancy were unclean and impermissible to Jews. When he refused, God asked him, Who are you to call unclean what I have made clean? We read about it in Acts chapter 11 and verse 1. It says, Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began and explained it to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners. And it came to me, looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were, sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house, and he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, 
Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has re granted repentance that leads to life. In another encounter, Paul confronted Peter for his hypocrisy. In Galatians 2, verse 7, we read, On the contrary, this is Paul writing, On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised. For he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me uh, for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas, that's Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, this very thing I was eager to do. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and was separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. And this brings us to what I like to call the big so what question. What does all of this have to do with you and me today? Well, it tells me, all of these stories tell me, that race is a reality that everyone has to deal with. Even Jesus had to deal with it. Everyone is part of a race. Everyone lives in a world full of people, unlike themselves because they are from different races. There is, it tells me also, that there is a Christian way to approach the issue of race. There is a way that we can be truly Christ-like in the way we treat people of other races. First, we should acknowledge that there are differences, just like Jesus did. We should expose racism wherever it shows itself. Sometimes Jesus exposed it by seeming to play along with it as, to, as if to illustrate the point that it was not right. Then we should ignore race when it comes to addressing the needs, especially the spiritual needs of any and every person. Then we should minister God's grace to everyone equally. Treat everyone as what they are, and that is a human being created in the image of God, possessing the same intrinsic value that you or I or anyone else who has ever lived possesses. It also tells me that we should remember that God is not primarily concerned with the color of a person's skin, but more so with the condition of their soul. And finally, it tells me that when all else fails, the golden rule is still the best rule of thumb to use. In Luke chapter 6, 31, Jesus said, And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. Now, I don't, do not pretend to have all of the answers with regard to race relations in America or anywhere else. But I know this much as the Apostle Paul declared in 1 Timothy 1.15, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance.
that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. No one ever deserved the salvation that Jesus offers less than I did when He found me, but He saved me anyway. There is no room for hate or partiality or even indifference in the heart of one of God's children. He has sent us to make disciples of every nation. To do any less would be disobedience, and that would be a sin. He's told us to feed the hungry and clothe the naked, to visit the sick and the imprisoned. He didn't say those of your own race. He said, whoever. Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, he said, you have done it unto me. Can we have a word of prayer as we close? Heavenly Father, I can't complete a message like this without acknowledging that in truth, we are one race. You created us in Adam and Eve. We are all descendants of Adam and Eve. And further down the line, we are all descendants of Noah and his wife. Lord, uh, this, this race thing is a tool of the devil. He certainly has used it and is using it to keep us apart, to give us some reason to treat one another differently just because of the color of our skin or the way we think and live and, and act, some of our unique characteristics. Lord, help us, help me, help us all to overcome the tendency to think that anyone that is not like me is not the way they should be. Because, Lord, You have created us. And You have put us in this world. You have placed us where You have placed us for a purpose. Just as every part of the body has a function, even though it may be different from all the other parts of the body, so too every member of the human race has a purpose, a place, and a reason for being a part of this great body called the human race. And no part is unimportant. And it's never acceptable to treat any part as if it doesn't belong or if it, as if it isn't important. Father, help us. Help us all as individuals, as a church, and as a nation to look beyond the color of one another's skin and to remember that you don't look on the outside, but you look on the heart. And Lord, I pray, that when you look at my heart, and when you look at the hearts of everyone listening into this today, that you will see in there someone who deeply desires to be like Jesus, who perhaps recognizes that there is still a long way to go before we get there, but who wants you to help us to continue that journey. Be with your church. Be with each one of us. Be with our leaders. Be with our nation, Lord. Be with uh, all of those leaders who are truly seeking reconciliation between the races. And help us, Lord, to come together and to remember that we are one in the bond of love. We are one in Your Spirit if we believe in You and if we seek to follow You. Help us, Lord, to get past our differences and to work together to make this world a better place for everyone so that we can all live free and happy and healthy and whole lives. Have your way in us, your people, and do your work through us, your people. And may you receive all the glory and all the praise because if you don't help us, it will never be done. We ask it all in the name of our Savior, Jesus who died for us all. In His name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a blessed day in the Lord. Pray about these things. Pray for me. And I'll be praying for you. And let us all commit ourselves to working towards making this world a better, more equitable place in which to live. God be with you.